These videos are offered on a pay-what-you-like basis. You can pay for the use of the videos at my website. There is a link to my website in the info box. The address is www.freelance-teacher.com slash videos dot htm or you can just use the link in the info box. By the way, I also offer tutoring via Skype and you can find more information about that Skype tutoring service at my website. Thanks. All right, so what did we learn about in chapter 17 about aldehydes and ketones? The key thing we learned is that the carbonyl carbon is electrophilic. We saw nucleophilic attacks on the carbonyl carbon, and we went through the four different categories of nucleophilic attack on the carbonyl carbon, which I still have on the board. Why is the carbonyl carbon electrophilic? Because it's partially positive. Right, because this oxygen is more electronegative than it. We also saw there's another reason why the carbonyl carbon is electrophilic. The other reason, remember, is that there's a resonance form where the carbonyl carbon has a full positive charge. We've also seen that there's a resonance form where the carbonyl carbon has a full positive charge. Well, positive charges are the kinds of things that make things into electrophiles. Yeah. So this has carbocation-like character. Why, when I drew this resonance form, why did I move the electrons towards the oxygen and not towards the carbonyl carbon? Because the carbonyl oxygen is more electronegative, so that's going to give a significant resonance form. Moving the pi electrons towards the carbonyl carbon is not going to give us a significant resonance form because it doesn't want the electrons that much. It's the oxygen that's more electronegative. This is an important point right here. Almost every topic that we go through this term Resonance, using resonance as an explanation is going to be very important. It's very important for a student to think of using resonance on their own, even if the problem doesn't mention the word resonance. I think something that you guys are probably getting pretty comfortable with when you're trying to get explanations, you're probably good, pretty good now at looking for delta positive and delta negative charges, and you're probably pretty good at looking for steric hindrance. You're probably pretty good at thinking about steric hindrance and delta and partial charges, but what most students are not good at yet is looking for other resonance forms. We need to get into the habit of, uh, when we're trying to explain something in OCHEM, asking if there's any other resonance forms. Well, what we need to do now is focus on how an aldehyde or a ketone can be nucleophilic, not electrophilic. Now, we know that it's the carbonyl carbon that can be electrophilic, which is the carbon that can be nucleophilic, the alpha carbon. I've been encouraging you to keep asterisking the carbonyl carbon and the carbonyl oxygen, and that's going to be really helpful to keep doing that in this chapter. And it's also going to be very helpful to now keep labeling the alpha carbon, because the, it's going to, the alpha carbon is going to be playing such an important role. So putting in those labels can be very helpful. Now, the alpha carbon is not very nucleophilic yet, but there's something that we can do that, to make it nucleophilic. How would we make this nucleophilic? How do we make things into nucleophiles by treating them with acid or base? By stealing an H and making it. Right. Uh, double bonded carbon, right. so therefore the pi bond will attack. Good, okay. So should we use an acid or a base to do acid. that? No, just getting base to steal. A base would take the proton. Alpha That's right. Here's what I think is the most useful way to draw that. So we can show the base taking this proton. Uh, and then the most useful way to draw that is to show the negative charge, show the lone pair just settling on the alpha carbon or here. you can do the enoid ion, which is right. just another resonance form of that. That's right. Good. Now, normally, it, normally bases don't take protons off of carbons. Normally, carbons are not acidic. There must be something special that's stabilizing this negative charge. Why is this more stabilized than a negative charge usually would be on a carbon? Because of an electron withdrawing oxygen? That, that is part of it, but that's not, that would not be a big enough factor. So you're saying because the oxygen is electronegative. Um, but the electronegativity, and so it's pulling the negative charge towards it. But that would normally not be enough to give this enough stabilization for this reaction to happen. We need another explanation for what's stabilizing that negative charge. 
How is it stabilizing it? Because it's partially positive. So that's right, although that's kind of similar to your previous example. So that's a good inductive answer. You're saying that it's stabilized by induction. Those are good answers. Those probably would not be strong enough factors. Oh, resonance. That's like right. You said that you know AI analytics. That's right. As I said, one of the key habits that students have to get into this term is we can't just keep explaining things in terms of induction and in terms of sterics. Now it's very important to look for resonance explanations. Almost all the different compounds we're going to be looking at have different resonance forms. So we have to get into the habit of looking for those different resonance forms. How is this different from a normal carb anion? It has resonance. There's another resonance form. where the negative charge is on this oxygen. Resonance is a very powerful way to stabilize charges. So this explains why we were able to take the proton off the carbon in the first place. In fact, a lot of instructors would oftentimes write the reaction like this. They show that when they take the, take the proton, they show the negative charge migrating all the way up to the oxygen in the first step. Uh, we've talked about in previous sessions, uh, there's going to be a lot of legal ways to draw the mechanisms now because a lot of the intermediates just differ by resonance. It doesn't really matter whether you show it this way or this way because the only difference is resonance. The only difference is whether the, uh, where these pi electrons are inside the molecule. A lot of instructors prefer to draw it this way because they think that the negative charge would like to be on the oxygen because it's electronegative. For a beginning student, though, I think it's much best to draw it this way. Um, and the reason is that the important thing to be able to do is to be able to predict the reactivity. Well, this picture makes it look like the alpha carbon is going to act like a nucleophile. And this picture makes it look like the oxygen is going to act like a nucleophile. But who's actually going to act like a nucleophile in this course? Almost always the alpha carbon. In this course, you're really, I don't think you're going to learn any reactions where the oxygen is the nucleophile. Except for silicon. Pardon? Silicon. Oh, yeah? Well, that's a reaction I haven't uh, even heard about. But if that's something that your instructors mentioned, maybe you need to uh, know about that. But in the vast majority of cases, it's the alpha carbon that's going to be the um, nucleophile. So it's unfortunate, I think, that instructors usually prefer this resonance form because it just overcomplicates things. Um, so I think I'm, I'm mostly going to stick to this, but you just have to recognize that you're going to see this drawn both ways uh, in class and um, in, in books, uh, but they only differ by resonance. Um, but the simplest thing is just to put the negative charge on the alpha carbon, because that shows what the reactivity is going to be. What, what's the name for this type of ion? Enolate ion. That's right. Both of these are called an enolate. Now, why are they called enolates? Because they're charged enols. This is what an enol would look like. So you can see clearly from this resonance form that an enolate is just a deprotonated enol. The enolate is just a deprotonated enol. Well, why is an enol called an enol? Because it has an alkene bond and an alcohol. Yeah, it has the alkene and alcohol. Uh, if you deprotonate it, we get an enolate. Now, it's hard to remember why this is called an enolate because it doesn't look that much like an enol anymore, but it's a resonance form of the deprotonated enol here. So anyway, when we have the deprotonated alpha carbon, we just need to memorize that the name for that is an enolate. Okay. So now we've seen that not only can the carbonyl carbon act like an electrophile, but it's very easy to turn the alpha carbon in an aldehyde or a ketone into a nucleophile. And that's the big theme of chapter 18, all the different things that this alpha carbon can then attack. That's the main theme of that chapter.